Good afternoon, and thank you for attending the rise of Chinese sea power, fear, honor, and interest with Dr. Toshi Yoshihara at the Institute of World Politics. Um, for those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs and 18 certificates of study. If you're interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this event. Dr. Toshi Yoshihara is a senior fellow at the Center for St Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, or CSBA. Before joining CSBA, Toshi Yoshihara held the John A. Van Buren Chair of Asia-Pacific Asia Studies at the U.S. Naval War College, where he taught strategy for over a decade. He was also an affiliate member of the War College's China Maritime Studies Institute. Dr. Yoshihara has been a visiting professor at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego, and the Strategy Department of the U.S. Air War College. He is co-author of Red Star Over the Pacific, China's Rise and the Challenge to the U.S. Maritime Strategy, which has been listed on the Chief of Naval Operations Professional Reading Program since 2012. Translations of Red Star over the Pacific have been published in China, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and Germany. He holds a PhD from Tufts University, an MA from Johns Hopkins University, and a BSFS from Georgetown University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Toshihara. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today to speak to you about uh, Chinese sea power. I want to talk in particular about both the character of Chinese sea power, but also the origins, the underlying motivations and rationales for China's turn to the sea. And those are kind of the two broad topics that I'd like to discuss. Now, one of the interesting trends that we've seen in uh, recent years about Chinese sea power is just how uncontroversial Chinese sea power has become. When I advanced a very similar argument back in 2010, now almost eight years ago, um, my argument was met with a great deal of skepticism, uh, if not a hostility. This notion that China's uh, sea power would be a serious challenge to both Asia and to the United States seemed outlandish eight years ago, uh, but not anymore. I think uh, it's become more or less conventional wisdom that uh, Chinese sea power is something that is serious, uh, and that's something that should be of concern both to Asian powers within the region, but also to the United States. And indeed, one of the indicators of this growing mainstreaming of this topic of Chinese sea power uh, is the fact that um, it's no longer strange to find news reporting by the mainstream media, whether it's the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, or the Washington Post, of some news about the Chinese sea power on the front pages of these newspapers. I think it highlights just how far uh, Chinese sea power has come. And indeed, I think one of the great indicators of the gradual mainstreaming of Chinese sea power is this. Newspaper cartoons, right, of Chinese sea power. And here we have the image of the Chinese uh, building a kind of a great wall at sea. Uh, and this theme persists in many of these cartoons, right? China building a great wall at sea, China building a great wall at sea. And of course, th these images are in part, uh, a, a re reflects in part a concern about China's buildup in the heart of the South China Sea. The island building campaign that we've seen unfold since 2013 uh, that has made international headlines. And I think just to kind of showcase to you what the Chinese have done is this kind of image of the evolution of how the Chinese were able to convert what were in fact features that were beneath the water uh, and build them into a basically a permanent foothold of Chinese presence, but potentially Chinese military power in the heart of the South China Sea. And that this has in fact given China a foothold uh, in a way that was deemed sort of unthinkable uh, just a few years ago. In any event, I think another issue that uh, is worth thinking about is just the scale of this buildup. Fiery Cross Reef, for example, dwarfs all of the other island holdings by Southeast Asia's other rival planets in the South China Sea. Uh, despite the fact that this has made headline news, and it's no longer strange to think about China as a sea power, 
Um, I think it is um, important to continue to push back against this narrative that China is a continental power, that China is a land power, and the idea that somehow because China is a land power, that its efforts at sea will somehow fail or falter. Uh, and that uh, this narrative continues to be quite strong despite this gradual mainstreaming of China's sea power that I've discussed. Um, so of course, if you look at a map, clearly China's a <laughs> land power. Right? There's no question China's a continental power. It shares land borders with 14 other countries, the most of any country in the world. Um, and if you think about the things that tend to trigger our imagination about China, whether it's the Great Wall of China, right, which is, of course, a very continental orientation. The wall is an edifice designed to halt uh, Central Asian hordes from invading the Chinese heartland. Or if you think about another cultural icon or, or historical icon, the Terracotta Warriors, which seems to suggest, again, that China historically has been really good at generating land power, but not so much in terms of sea power. And so it's not surprising, I think, that I faced a lot of pushback almost 10 years ago, uh, when I articulated this argument about Chinese sea power, because I think this idea persisted certainly then, and in, in, in some case persists to this very day, which is this notion that you know China is a land lover learning how to swim, right? And to use another animal metaphor, uh, it's like uh, imagining that an elephant would learn to become an, a, a whale, right? To learn how to swim in the ocean. How implausible that project is. What I want to do, though, is to, in line with this mainstreaming of Chinese sea power, is to reinforce this notion that China is indeed turning to the seas, and that it is far too soon to render any judgment that somehow China's sea power project will fail. That in fact, there's every evidence that China's turn to the seas will in fact be a permanent factor in Asian politics for years, if not decades, to come. And that's my central argument today. And I think there's plenty of evidence of this, at least materially. I love this picture because I think this picture perfectly encapsulates the Chinese Navy's transformation. The Chinese Navy has transitioned from a largely coastal defensive force composed of obsolescent Soviet technologies, as represented by this dinky ship in the foreground, to an increasingly modern capable fighting force as represented by that beautiful surface combatant in the background. I think this picture, just this one picture, captures this transformation, this metamorphosis of the Chinese Navy for at least the past decade or more. And of course, it's not only the fact that the Chinese are building newer things, they're building a lot of them. They're engaged in serial production of all sorts of surface combatants, from cruisers to destroyers to frigates to corvettes. And here we have a picture of, of, of a line of these capabilities being showcased by the Chinese. And of course, the one thing that captures the, uh, the international imagination, of course, is the Chinese carrier program. Chinese Commission won in 2012, another one is, is in the works. And of course it's not surprising this captures the imagination, right? Because this is, of course, um, the most powerful symbol of, of a country's ability to project power, to engage in command of the sea. Um, and what's, I think, striking about this particular picture is that for those of you who know the Navy well, served in the Navy, or are still currently serving the Navy, is that this is a classic US Navy photo X, right? This is a picture uh, that you would find uh, captured in terms of capturing U.S. formations, U.S. carrier strike groups and amphibious strike groups, expeditionary strike groups in formation. This picture is in many ways a microcosm of Chinese efforts at sea, which is to essentially replicate, to mimic, to imitate every major and minor aspect of the U.S. Navy. In essence, I think what the Chinese are trying to do at a smaller scale uh, is to create uh, what some have called the mini-me of the U.S. Navy. And I think this is something worth watching, both in terms of their capabilities, but also in terms of their doctrine, their practices at sea, and so forth. But it's not just about big ships, gray hulls flying the seas. I think sea power needs to be conceived in much broader terms. I would argue that sea power, understood properly, is really any implement of national power that can be used to influence events directly at sea. And so one element of sea power, in my view, is Chinese air power. Here we have a picture of a Chinese medium range bomber uh, conducting what people have concluded uh, was a deterrent patrol in the heart of the South China Sea. This air power, this, this medium bomber presumably can carry long-range anti-ship cruise missiles to threaten U.S. surface forces. What's important about this picture is what's actually behind the bomber. 
what's that island feature or that 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 feature that that uh, mostly underwater feature in the background? That's Scarborough Shoal, which is of course a disputed piece of territory that's been in dispute between China and the Philippines, a territory, a piece of feature that the Chinese seized in 2012. And the Chinese have conducted this patrol, and this is of course a very high resolution photograph issued by the Chinese military to send a signal, to signal China's resolve, right, in defending what it considers to be its rightful territory and claims. A signal that was not lost, certainly in the Philippines, but not lost on the United States either. But it's not just air power. Missile power could be considered to be an element of Chinese sea power. Here we have a picture of an anti-ship ballistic missile. It's a missile that's mounted on a truck, as you can see, and this, this missile can be launched from deep inside the Chinese mainland, launched directly from the mainland, and then in theory, uh, the warhead, after the, uh, the missile is launched, would in theory re-enter the Earth's atmosphere at very high velocity, and again, in theory, would be able to, in pinpoint fashion, target a moving surface combatant at sea out in the middle of the ocean. And in fact, uh, most estimates conclude that this missile can go as far as Guam. So really, into the heart of the Western Pacific. Again, the ability to control the vents at sea directly from the Chinese mainland is another kind of sea power. But it's not just military power, it's also civilian, non-military power. So China's Coast Guard cutters, China's Coast Guard fleet, is also an arm, an implement of Chinese sea power to be able to impose China's will and prerogatives in the maritime domain. This particular platform is interesting. It's called the Monster. And it's called a monster because it displaces over 10,000 tons. It's the largest Coast Guard, of its, Coast Guard cutter of its kind in the world. Now you might wonder, why, why would you build this monster, this massive uh, uh, vessel? Well, if your doctrine is to ram first and ask questions later, then that, that lends itself automatically to the logic of building something this big because you want to build platforms that are large enough for you to outmuscle your rival claimants in the maritime domain. And it's not just that the Chinese are building much bigger things. There's also another interesting element of Chinese sea power, which is the civil military nexus. Here we have another White Hole China Coast Guard vessel. This is in, in many ways a descendant of, or a converted version of a Chinese naval combatant. This is in fact formerly a Chinese frigate converted into a Coast Guard cutter vessel. Right, this is formerly the Type 054 frigate, as the Chinese very helpfully demonstrates uh, in this image. They've been converting, essentially, and transferring gray hulls, transferring at least the technology and the capabilities so that they can paint them white. And presumably, they would have the characteristics of a combatant. Think of another white hull. This one is largely considered to be a, a conversion or descendant of a Chinese Corvette from the Chinese Navy. Again, presumably with the characteristics, the strengths, the staying power, the seagoing capabilities of a naval combatant. These are all, I think, should be considered all part of Chinese sea power, not just big ships, big naval ships, gray hulls, flying the seas. And when we think about Chinese sea power in these broad terms, you get a sense for both the, both the scale and the multivarious challenges that the Chinese are able to impose both on its neighbors but also on the United States. It's not just the fact that there are many types of sea power that China can use to influence events in the maritime domain. It's also the sheer size, the sheer scale, the quantity of stuff the Chinese are building. So according to the annual report by the Pentagon on the Chinese military, they've been stating for at least the three years, I believe for the past three years, if not more, about the simple fact that the Chinese Navy is already the largest navy in Asia. Based on my estimates, uh, if you look at China's surface fleet, uh, it is growing by leaps and bounds. In fact, the transformation is remarkable. It's startling. It's astonishing. Whatever adjective you can think of, I'd be happy to attach to this uh, graph, which is that by my count, China's modern surface cap combatants 10 years ago was about seven. And it's, again, you can, you can debate what, what to include, what not to include, but let's say seven. By last year, China had over 80 what would be considered modern surface combatants. This is a transformation of historic proportions. There are only few times in maritime and naval history where great powers have been able to generate this kind of naval power. 
And based on what's already being built or launched in 2017, we expect another tranche that would push China to over 90 surface combatants by 2018. So, more than 90 surface combatants two years before 2020. Imagine the trend lines if this continues into the 2020s. Indeed, we have very careful, reputable observers of the Chinese Navy um, that have made these kinds of observations. Based on Rear Admiral Mike McDivitt's estimates, uh, he basically argues <coughs> that uh, the Chinese Navy will by 2020 be the largest Navy in the world, surpassing that of the United States and that it would be the second most capable expeditionary force, second only to the U.S. Navy. This, this was his conclusion back in 2016. If you had asked him, if you had asked Mike 10 to 15 years ago whether he would make this statement, he would say, no, absolutely not. Are you crazy? Why would I make a statement like that? Uh, this just, again, goes to show uh, the dramatic, I think, leaps in capabilities that China has experienced over just over the past decade. Based on another reputable projection, by 2030, uh, China could have as many as, as 432 combatants by 2030. In terms of context, compare that against the size of the U.S. Navy today, which is roughly 275, 278. I think that's the range. But anyway, it's 270 plus for the U.S. Navy. How does that compare against uh, the plans or the hopes for the, for the U.S. Navy to build up to 350? Uncertain. Uh, even if we start now for that buildup, it's going to take a long time to, to bring that to fruition. So, now that I've established for you, I think what I've done, hopefully what I've been able to do, is to paint you this broad picture, both of the various types and categories of, of national power that should be considered part of Chinese sea power, and then just the scale, the, the sheer scale and pace of China's naval modernization. Again, I, I, I think adjectives like breathtaking, remarkable, amazing, I think they all fit. I have no problem using any of those adjectives to describe the rise of Chinese sea power. What I want to do now, though, is to transition to the second part of my talk, which is why. Why is China devoting all of this tremendous amount of national resources into a sea power project? As we all know, navies are inherently capitalist. This requires the dedication of national will and national resources. <coughs> will. So why? What I'm going to do, uh, oh, actually, before I do that, I want to talk about non-military power. It's not just that naval power is experiencing a dramatic rise. It's that China's civilian maritime law enforcement fleet is also rising at a rapid pace. In fact, back in 2015, according to this uh, Department of Defense report, the Chinese maritime law enforcement fleet was already larger than all of the maritime law enforcement fleets in Asia combined. So look at this graph. I think this graph says it all. Uh, the, just the sheer size of the maritime law enforcement fleet. So again, now that I've established for you this development, <coughs> the scale and the scope and the pace of China's uh, naval and maritime development, I'm going to talk about why. So I'm going to talk about three motives, the subtitle of my talk. Uh, honor, fear, and interests. And this is drawn from uh, Thucydides uh, his, and his writings chronicling the ancient Greek conflict, great power conflict between Athens and Sparta more than 2,000 years ago, the Peloponnesian War. And he argued uh, in this chronicle that interstate conflict, interstate confrontation can all be traced back to these three primary motives. And in fact, what's interesting is that senior civilian leaders in the United States, as well as military leaders, have referenced this. And what's also important to note is a kind of a renaissance in Thucydides and the Peloponnesian War, partly due to Professor uh, Graham Allison's book, a Harvard professor, about the so-called Thucydides trap uh, that could entrap both China and the United States. And he's, he's made some great strides in kind of popularizing this idea of Thucydides, the Peloponnesian War, and how it helps us think through our challenges today. So, riding under that coattail, or jumping on that bandwagon, if you will, I think it's only appropriate to use Thucydides' three motives as a way to explain China's rise at sea. So, what I'm going to do to make the stick is to associate each variable, each motive, with a number. <laughs> 
Honor is associated with 470. Fear is associated with this number 3. And interest is associated with 3 million. And I'll explain to you each factor why each variable is, is specifically associated with this number in the Chinese narrative. So honor and this number 470. What is this about? Well, let me refer you back to an authoritative figure in the Chinese Navy, the former commander of the Chinese Navy, Admiral Wu Shengli, um, who uh, relinquished his command uh, earlier last year in early 2017. Um, but he's credited for essentially pushing forward this tremendous progress in China's naval modernization. Um, very, very influential uh, and really did push forward all of the progress that we've seen thus far. Here he is pictured at the U.S. Naval War College at the International Sea Power Symposium, uh, a symposium that brought together all the heads of Navy around the world. And this was the first time that a Chinese delegation that he led came to attend the symposium. Now, he doesn't look particularly happy here. I don't know why. It's because he's uh, sitting next to his Japanese counterpart on stage. Uh, I think that's partly uh, why. Uh, you, you can see from the body language when he realized that he was going to be seated with his Japanese counterpart, how uncomfortable he was and how uncomfortable his counterpart was as well. In any event, in a very authoritative article that he wrote about 10 years ago, basically laying out his plans, he's saying, I'm now the new commander of the Chinese Navy. Let me tell you what I'm going to do with it. He makes a couple of important arguments for why China needs to develop sea power. And one of it is a historical one. Right? China's history uh, is one that is something that the Chinese leadership believes that it needs to um, restore honor to. This is why this is related to honor. Because of the dishonor that was visited on China during the century of humiliation. The so-called century of humiliation that began in 1840 and lasted into the 1940s. This period was a period of Chinese weakness. As a result of Chinese weakness, it invited Western imperial aggression. And the key here is that Chinese weakness, internal weakness, led to external aggression, and most of that aggression came from the sea. How many times? 470 times, right? It's 470 is a powerful number. It's in fact, the consensus number among Chinese scholars about the number of times that China was invaded from the sea. And so the lesson is clear, never again. Never will China be humiliated by great powers again. It must wash away this dishonor and to restore honor to the Chinese. And what do you do then? Well, you've got to be very strong at sea, right? The logic is, in order to re prevent the repeat of history, China has to be very strong at sea. And when you talk about this consensus number, these are people who are counting. These are people who have chips on their shoulders, right? They've got something to prove. The Admiral certainly feels a personal responsibility to right this historical wrong. And this is a powerful emotive force associated with honor that I think drives China to the seas. In fact, what's interesting is that here is an image, a great image, of the Chinese depiction of the various pathways and corridors, lines of approach that foreign powers have used to invade China. Okay? So it lists not only the dates, and all of the major Western imperial powers that invaded China in these areas. It's numbered, it clicks, and of course, all of these events add up to 470. Okay. So again, powerful emotive force driving China to the sea. The second factor is fear. And this, number, uh, this, this fear is associated with the number three. And the number three is associated with this uniquely Chinese geospatial view of the maritime domain. What I'm talking about is the so-called three island chains, which I'll explain shortly. So, let's talk about the first island chain. The first island chain stretches from Japan down to the Ryukyus, through Taiwan, through the Philippines. It's important to note that this island chain construct is a quintessentially Chinese construct. It's only the first island chain. It only makes sense geospatially if you're sitting in Beijing looking out into the western Pacific. On the one hand, the first island chain could be seen as a way to measure how far Chinese military power can project power out to. But it's also seen as a physical impediment, as a geographical constraint on China's maritime ambitions. You can see these islands as, in some ways, a metaphor, as sentinels, guarding against China's ability to project power into the Western Pacific. 
Or another uh, analogy uh, is that this is a great wall in reverse. Right? This is a great wall used to hem in the Chinese horde from the seas. Or another metaphor is that this is a maritime straitjacket that threatens to hem China in. So there's, a, in some ways, a very claustrophobic view of the maritime environment. This constitutes fear. Um, so I'm going to let the Chinese speak for themselves about the island chains. This is where the three island chains come from. The first island chain, according to this Chinese map, stretches from the Aleutians down through Japan and ends all the way in Singapore. The white boxes along the first island chain are U.S. naval bases and access points. The second island chain runs through the Marianas, centered on Guam, another hub of American naval power. And then, of course, there's a third island chain. That's why the three island chains. And the third island chain, centered on Pearl Harbor, another hub of American naval power. And if you ask some Chinese privately, and some scattering of articles that I've come across, have, have said that there's a fourth island chain. And that's, of course, the American West Coast, centered on San Diego, another hub of American naval power. This is a, a geostrategic construct, essentially, that basically says that when the Chinese look out into the Western Pacific, what they see are three concentric rings of American military power that stretches from the American homeland right into China's backyard. Now, I'm not asking you to accept this view, but I think it does indeed animate the way the Chinese describe their physical environment. And they like to talk about, for example, America's attempt to contain China or the fact that the United States has not given up its Cold War mentality against China. That has to be understood in this geostrategic context. And of course, what are they, who do they fear most? The United States. In Chinese doctrinal writings, they frequently use the term strong enemy, powerful adversary, or powerful enemy, powerful opponent, strong opponent. These are all code words for the United States. And they never use the word, United, the, the phrase United States. They always use this code word to describe America's potential challenge to China. And of course, this ability to project power into China's backyard can only be supported by the military infrastructure on those three island chains. But it's not just a strategic military problem. It's also a fundamentally geoeconomic problem, in the sense that the first island chain forms a series of narrow seas and choke points through which Chinese mariners, whether they're commercial or military in nature, must pass through in order to reach the open waters of the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. And what is particularly annoying to the Chinese is, of course, the occupants of the first island chain, including, most annoyingly, Taiwan, are either formal allies or close friends of the United States. This animates the Chinese thinking, the Chinese fear, in this case, that the United States, with a coalition could seek to strangle China, to deny Chinese access to the sea lanes so critical to its economic growth. This animates the so-called Malacca Dilemma that's been bandied about since the early 2000s, about this notion that China, that the, a hostile power, aka the United States, could engage in a distant blockade west of the Malacca Strait to, again, squeeze China economically. Again, is this a rational fear? Is this an irrational fear? I, I leave that to you to decide. But I think this certainly animates the Chinese narrative about, we're worried about this, we need to project power in order to protect our legitimate maritime interests that could be threatened by hostile outside powers along the first island chain. What's also important to note uh, is that there has been a dramatic social, economic, demographic transformation in China since the reform era, since the reform and opening in the late 1970s. What we've seen is a massive migration of the Chinese population to the coastal areas, looking for jobs, looking for manufacturing work. And what we've seen is a cluster of people, masses of people, settling and working and becoming hubs of economic demand as well, along three areas. The Bohai Economic Rim to the north, centered on Beijing and Tianjin. The Yangtze River Delta Economic Zone, centered on Shanghai and Ningbo. And then the Pearl River Delta economic zone centered on Guangzhou and Shenzhen. Just to give you a sense of the scale, these are no longer megacities. They're called megalopolises. Megalopolises are defined as essentially a series of megacities that are in such close proximity that it's hard to separate them. They basically become this one big giant blob. 
called a megalopolis. Again, just to give you a sense of the scale, depending on where you draw the boundary of the Pearl River Delta economic zone, there may be as many as 46 million people living in that pocket of land. That's larger than most mid-sized, large-sized European countries, living in that pocket alone. These areas, these three zones in particular, have become the most important political, economic, cultural epicenters of Chinese power. And of course, they're all on the coast. And the Chinese feel an imperative to protect these critical centers of gravity. So you can see how China's internal development, the migration, the demographic transformation along the coast, uh, has interacted with the external dimension, the first island chain, and this concern about American power projection, right? That the United States could very easily threaten this Chinese seaboard. This adds to the Chinese sphere. Let me now talk about interests. And it's associated with this number three million. Let me go back to Admiral Wu Li in that authoritative article that I told you about. The three million refers to the three, squ three million square kilometers that China believes that it has both sovereignty and jurisdictional claims. If you agree with this number, then you would have to agree that China has sovereignty and jurisdictional claims in 80 to 90% of the South China Sea. If you take away the South China Sea, China wouldn't have this number of 3 million square kilometers. And in this 3 million square kilometers are all sorts of strategic and economic interests vital to China's uh, core interests. So if you think about the, the South China Sea, this body of water, for example, of course, uh, it, it is home to fish. Seafood has become an increasingly important component of the Chinese diet, particularly as disposable income has increased in China to be able to get seafood. Another, of course, is the supposed undersea uh, energy resources, both in gas and oil. Uh, that's been speculated about four years now, both in the East and South China Sea. But it's also important to see the South China Sea as a critical economic corridor, through which all of the goods and services from Europe, Middle East, and Africa must pass through the Malacca Strait and pass through the South China Sea to reach the Chinese market. So the South China Sea should be understood both as an economic corridor, but also from the fear side, a strategic buffer. Right? To extend China's buffer zone as far forward as possible. To protect, for example, China's center of gravity, like uh, the uh, Pearl River Delta economic zone. It's not surprising, therefore, that the Chinese have engaged in almost a decade worth of anti-piracy patrols, virtually uninterrupted since 2008, to guard what China considers to be critical sea lines of communications, the lifeblood essential to China's economic growth. <clears throat> and so again, it's not surprising that Chinese leaders at the highest levels of government have declared that China attaches great value to its maritime domain and to its sea power project. Here we have President Xi Jinping in last year's New Year's address, not this year's, but last year's New Year's address, mm -hmm. saying that China will absolutely resolute in defending China's maritime rights and interests. Rights and interests. Maritime rights and interests is kind of the, the, the broad concept that defines um, the things that China cares about in the maritime domain. And that nobody should seek to interfere in China's maritime interests. This is a thinly veiled message, certainly to the regional claimants in the South China Sea, but also to the United States. Or think about uh, Premier Li Keqiang, the number two in the Chinese party apparatus, who described China's oceans as precious blue territory. Uh, I, I, I think this evocative phrase, and the, the, the literal translation is blue national soil, right? This very evocative concept of territorializing the sea, <coughs> just to highlight, to underscore how much China values the maritime domain. I mean, imagine. Vice President Mike Pence saying that the waters off of California and the waters around Hawaii are America's blue national soil. It's designed to be very evocative. All right, so given what I've laid out to you, China's buildup of its sea power, and also um, the motives, the underlying motives that's driving China to the sea, that I think are very powerful, I'm going to render three judgments. And the uh, and then I, I, will, I will open the floor up for discussions about what, what this means in terms of policy implications for the United States and uh, various countries in Asia. The first one is it's very clear based on the Chinese writings, based on 
just my interpretation of those three motives, that China attaches extraordinarily high value to its goals and objectives in the maritime domain. And I think what's important to note here is that many of China's goals, driven by things like honor and fear and interests, are in some ways fundamentally incompatible with U.S. interests, maritime interests and goals, in that same body of water. So whereas China asserts, I think, it, what would be considered excessive maritime jurisdictional claims, say, in the South China Sea, is fundamentally at odds with American conceptions of the freedom to use the sea. This is not something that's going to change anytime soon because China attaches great value to it, and so does the United States, in order to fulfill America's various commitments and to fulfill its long-standing grand strategy in Asia. And we can, we, can, we can debate this, of course, during the Q&A, but I would argue that for the United States to fulfill those obligations and to achieve those objectives, it cannot back down from its goals, and neither can China. So I think one expectation about the Sino-U.S. relationship in the maritime domain is that we're going to have a protracted competition, confrontation, and rivalry in the maritime domain. Just because the stakes are so high and that neither side will likely seek to accommodate each other. I just don't see how China could accommodate the United States on these goals and vice versa. That's judgment number one. Judgment number two is that if you think about this massive maritime buildup on the part of the Chinese, is that China's turn to the seas will be a permanent phenomenon in Asian politics for years to come. China will not vacate the seas anytime soon, short of a cataclysm. But certainly short of a cataclysm, China will not vacate the seas. And China's turn to the seas will not be an ephemeral, well, an ephemeral phenomenon or a passing fad. And as a result, maritime Asia will become ever more competitive for both countries residing in that region, but also for the United States. The seas will literally become more congested as Chinese maritime power is felt throughout the, what the Chinese call the Near Seas. And I think what's important to note here is that two decades ago, if a U.S. Naval Service combatant were to sail through the South China Sea, uh, it could, conceivably, 20 years ago, not run into a single Chinese naval vessel or Coast Guard vessel. Today, it is very likely that a Chinese naval vessel entering into the South China Sea would be greeted by a Chinese counterpart with a bridge-to-bridge -bridge communication from the Chinese saying something like, welcome to Chinese waters, and be trailed <coughs> throughout its entire patrol for sailing through the South China Sea. This is going to be the new normal. As a result, I believe this leads me to my third and final judgment, which is that if the United States is to fulfill its grand strategy, fulfill its objectives in the region, its commitments to its allies and friends in the region, then in this ever more congested competitive environment, the United States will have to accept more risk. But not only to accept more risk, but also to very deliberately take more risk in order for that risk to match the value that the United States attaches to its objectives in the region. And, and again, we can have a debate and a discussion about what I mean by risk, and I can talk, and, I, and I'm happy to talk about risk both at the operational, but most importantly at the strategic level. Um, and that I'm saying that the United States should take more risk and accept more risk, both at the strategic and operational levels. So finally, my last slide is, this brings up to kind of the so what, what are the broad policy implications? So first of all, I think, um, although I think some people in certain quarters inside the Beltway uh, remain reluctant to admit what's going on, that there is in fact a competition already taking place in the maritime domain between China and the United States. That the maritime domain will become ever more competitive for the United States and that that's actually going to be the new normal and that the competition and the competitive dynamics are likely to intensify in the coming years. And therefore, the United States and policymakers in the United States must reconsider reacquaint themselves with risk. Risk that the United States has been very used to taking, particularly in the high stakes competition, say, with the Soviet Union. We took risks daily during that time period that would be almost unthinkable today. But it means that we have the skill set. It means that we've been accustomed to taking risks, and we just have to reacquaint ourselves with this idea.
Um, and that means, of course, that if we are to be able to take risks effectively, we need to be able to devote our national resources to the project. And finally, as the balance shifts increasingly in China's favor, I think it might require the United States to think about asymmetric approaches. In other words, not to seek to compete against China head to head, strength against strength, but to take a page from the Chinese themselves to think about approaches that target, for example, Chinese weaknesses, that exploit Chinese weaknesses, versus going into a head to head competition against Chinese strength. Uh, and I think this is a particularly uh, this is a particularly important imperative, not only for the United States but for U.S. allies, who are much smaller and much weaker in a material sense compared to compared to China. So I think I lay out I think uh, some of the issues that I think are worth discussing, and uh, it's been a real pleasure to speak to you today. And uh, I'd like to conclude my talk and open this up for questions. Thank you.